Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being here. And uh, um, I'm also very grateful to um, Ahmad and Yazid and everyone at the Qatan Foundation for uh, inviting us to participate. Um, I'd also like to say a very quick thank you to our simultaneous translators because that is a very hard job. So thank you very much. Um, this is going to be a, um, a two-parter. So I'm going to speak for a bit. And then my research assistant, uh, Chloe, is going to speak a little bit um, as well. There's a third research assistant, um, Anne Caldwell, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, but we're going to be speaking a bit about how Palestine was depicted from the sky in several parts of the British um, archives, thinking particularly about how fantasies of um, the Bible and ancient history um, have a symbiotic relationship with British attempts to exert control over um, Ottoman uh, Palestine leading up to the First World War. Now, the boundaries that the British um, decided on for their mandate of Palestine bore only a superficial relationship to older forms of division. So we heard a bit before about how the Ottomans had changing administrative boundaries. Um, and we also heard a bit before about the Sykes-Picot Agreement and how that attempts to divide the Middle East between the British and the French. Here we see two examples. The one on the left is the Ottoman divisions at the time of the First World War. And here on the right is the map of the divisions of Sykes-Picot. As you can see, there is no singular entity for Palestine. But nonetheless, the British decided to draw a line um, that uh, was their division of um, Palestine and the Holy Land. And this really emerged um, at the discussions that took place almost exactly a century ago um, at first the Versailles Peace Conference and then the San Remo uh, Conference in 1919 and 1920. Now, when the British were thinking about where Palestine was, they didn't think about the Ottoman Empire and they didn't even really think about Sykes-Picot. Here's a memorandum from the British delegation at Paris in 1919. Palestine, for the purposes of this memorandum, may be best described as the Palestine of the Old Testament, extending from Dan to Beersheba. There is a question as to the exact boundaries, and these will have to be settled by the commissioners. This is as typical a British attitude as you can get on Palestine. The idea that it's basically the land of the Old Testament, but we don't really know where the Old Testament lands were. Now, this is a very old attitude that stretches right back to the first British involvement directly in uh, Palestine. In 1838, taking advantage of the um, Egyptian occupation of the forces of Mehmet Ali, the British decided to extend their political and cultural and economic um, influence in Palestine and appointed a consul to reside in the city of Jerusalem. Now, the consul that they chose was a young man called William Tanner Young. He was a, a, a Christian restorationist, so he believed strongly that the end times were approaching and that the Jews needed to come to Palestine in order for that to happen. When he went to Palestine, he undertook a tour around his new jurisdiction. And this is the map that he took. But this is not a map of Palestine as it was in 1838. It's a map of the Holy Land. The divisions bear no resemblance to Palestine in the 1830s, nor do the cities necessarily bear any resemblance to, to Palestine in the 1830s. He has used the divisions of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he has used the biblical names. His tour um, from Jerusalem only takes in sites where there are large Jewish populations, specifically around the Galilee in Safed um, and Tiberias. Um, and he also travels to important Christian sites. What about, though, the city in which he was to reside, Jerusalem? Presumably he would have an up-to-date map of Jerusalem. No. He has a map of Jerusalem as it was imagined in the time of the, sec of the Temple of Solomon. So instead of having the Haram Sharif as it was, we have instead the Temple um, of uh, Solomon and the Jews. So this begins to tell us how the fantasies of the British, biblical and ancient, uh, shape their political engagement. Now, Jerusalem in particular was a site of fantasy and projection, even when it comes to detailed maps produced by British military forces. And as we'll see, there's a very close relationship between the British military expertise and those people who are interested in the Bible and ancient history. This is a very impressive and absolutely enormous map produced of Jerusalem and its surroundings uh, by the Royal Engineers um, in 1864. Now, there's two important 
important things to note about this map. First of all, the area around Jerusalem has nothing in it. Even though we know that there are agricultural fields and makams and settlements around Jerusalem, the British portray this as a barren land. This is important because this will be a recurring theme. The second thing is how Jerusalem itself is depicted. Now, this is a very detailed and largely accurate map of Jerusalem in the 1860s. But what the engineers have done is they've superimposed the Western ideas of the four quarters of Jerusalem. So this was not a, an Ottoman or a Palestinian idea. This is a fantasy of the Europeans. They've imposed those on top of the local um, names for the different neighborhoods of the city. So immediately we're seeing the barren landscape of Palestine and the imposition of British ideas of name places and divisions. Another uh, map that's produced at roughly the same time, uh, based on the, uh, the observations and the drawings of British military figures, um, is, is stuff like this. Now, this is considered to be a, a map, even though we might uh, think of it simply as uh, an illustration of Jerusalem. It was designed for the working men's clubs uh, in Britain. So this is something that would be distributed to ordinary working people to give them a sense of the holy city. Uh, and again, Jerusalem sits um, uh, amidst a very barren uh, landscape. And another important thing to note here are the two figures that you might be able to spot there on the bottom right. It's very common in British Orientalist imaginings of the Holy Land to have some uh, local observers um, watching upon uh, the scene below. And these observers often are ambiguous in terms of their time. So these could be Palestinian peasants, or these could be figures from the time of the Bible. And this blurring of the chronology is, is very important. And this is the sort of scene that would be replicated uh, in many different forms of British views um, of Palestine uh, from above, from high elevation uh, imaging and uh, 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 illustration. So again, here we see from a very important uh, travel narrative, Syria and the Holy Land, that's published in the 1840s, a similar kind of theme. Jerusalem is sitting there amidst a barren landscape and two local observers are sitting there discussing um, the scene. Now, this particular publication um, is a very influential one in uh, creating this notion that Palestine is largely a barren land. And the importance of this land being barren is, of course, that the British can then build and fill that space with whatever fantasies um, they choose. So many maps that are produced by the British thinking about Palestine from above are largely quite empty. This is a very um, representative uh, example. Again, this is something that was made for popular distribution. So it was designed to go to Sunday schools, Christian Sunday schools, to be put up uh, on the wall. As you can see, it's largely empty. We just have the landscape and the topography. The only signs of habitation bear no resemblance to the cities of modern Palestine, but are instead, again, imaginings of where the biblical communities would be. And this is something that we find in many of the maps produced by the British of the Holy Land. They are interested in history, but the history they are interested in uh, is not the history of the Ottoman or Mamluk or any other uh, Islamic period, um, simply skipping all of that and going back to biblical and ancient history. This is a particularly interesting example, a new historical map published in 1838, and that shows Palestine in its wider um, geographic context, but again, very much thinking about the biblical elements. So again, we have a view of Jerusalem. This one is very much a fantasy view. The Dome of the Rock has morphed into a kind of representation of the Temple of Solomon, as it was imagined by the British. And again, we have our biblical kind of observer figures um, in the front. The, the figure of the woman holding the, the jug on her head is a, is a particularly popular one. But we also have different layers of time within maps like this. So if you look at the detail, you'll see that the, the map is crisscrossed with lots of different lines. Now, these lines are nothing to do with the roads or the infrastructure of Palestine. They are rather the different routes from history that people took across it. So in the middle, kind of uh, this one here, this is the route of the children of Israel as they walk in their wanderings throughout um, the Holy Land. Uh, these ones over here, the dark uh, black lines, 
These are the routes of European travellers as they go around um, the area. The only reference this map has to any Palestinians living in this area is this, the Hajj route. So it has the Hajj route intersecting uh, across um, the area. So these maps are not interested in Palestine as it, as it was in the 19th century. Rather, they are interested in, in how it had been and might be again um, in ancient and biblical times. So again, this map shows the division of Palestine into the areas of the 12 tribes, and it only really marks ancient biblical and ancient Roman and Greek um, cities. And this ancient Roman and Greek aspect um, is very important to the British self-identity as a new up-and-coming empire. And so it meant that we have lots of investigations into the archaeology of um, Palestine. And that's something that Chloe's um, now going to speak to us uh, a little bit about. Hi, um, I'm going to talk about the survey of Western Palestine. It was produced by the Royal Engineers across a couple of years, well, more than a couple of years, from 1871 to 1877. And they surveyed pretty much most of Western Palestine. And 26 map sheets were produced between 1881 and 1888, alongside six, and they're all about that big, pretty big, six volumes of text covering observations on the archaeology, flora and fauna, waterways, memoirs, manners and customs, and place names. And they also, very interestingly, produced two maps of the Old and New Testament. And this is the Old Testament. And it shows there's sort of dots everywhere about important places in the Bible and including the Apophrica and Josephus, and this key with everything. It's incredibly biblical. And where's our next slide? And what is also incredibly interesting is in the introduction, it is the first picture you see is a crusading knight. It was harking back to this image of the British as the inheritors of this, what they'd sort of term Western civilization, which was the inheritance from the biblical world and the classical world. And this was used as a sort of justification for why they were there, because it was their inheritance. And I'm not quite sure if you can see. Yeah, it says the necessity for a society entirely devoted to the work of collecting facts and information bearing on the Holy Land, its geography, ruins people and customs, seems first to have been perceived by a few Englishmen about the beginning of this century. And this is in reference to the Palestine Exploration Fund, which organised the survey of Western Palestine in conjunction with the military and sort of basically anyone they could give get to give them some money, which I think also accounts for the slightly confused nature of the maps. They're part sort of accurate military. There are letters in the archives suggesting that the government may find them very useful, yet they also have this incredible biblical focus. They, even the non-specifically biblical focus maps, all the volumes are divided into areas such as Galilee, Samaria, which relate to the sort of how the British viewed Palestine, which is almost sort of like a Bible theme park or something. It was and again, we have another image here. This is, what's this one showing? Yes, this is a close-up of one of the detailed 26 sheets. And they also made a composite map of the whole country altogether. And what's also interesting is because they needed to hark back to the history and this sort of unbroken line of linear progress, which they were focused on, and particularly during the Victorian age, I think mapping and archaeology were seen as part of this development of science and exploration. So it was something concrete and scientific and absolute proof. It was unbiased, even though it was incredibly biased, but they conceived it as sort of this yeah, unbiased evidence, and that was behind a lot of biblical archaeology. And there are about 26 plates like this of various sites. The vast majority of them are either biblical, classical, or crusader, or in some cases, 
In case of Besan or Tsivkopolis, they've given it its ancient Greek name as well, both. And the plan to me, I trained as an archaeologist, this looks more like a plan of an archaeological site than a map. And if you can only just about see the modern village down the bottom. There's, the houses are barely distinguished, it's just a sort of little, just sort of like... blobs on the map really yeah when you look at the archaeological features things in such detail as columns are mentioned capitals the tops of columns graves everything the old ancient roads the theater it's incredibly detailed it's interesting i was reading the notes that go along with this and they have a large description of the ancient ruins and the village is just described as about 60 mud huts they're just not interested or well, the only time they do seem to be interested in the local villages is via the naming. They take, alongside this massive list of ruins, which they compiled alongside the survey, including plans like this, they compiled a list of all the Arabic names. And the main reason they compiled these names was they've attempted to sort of go back through history and see if they could get from the Arabic to the ancient Hebrew and how they could identify these lost biblical sites and then reclaim it for Christendom as this was the sort of proof the British were meant to be there and inherit everything. And, and this is, there's also illustrations. I think they were taken from some photographs but they end up as engravings. This is the Acropolis and ruins of Besan and Again, relating to what Michael was saying, it's incredibly empty. You wouldn't notice that they've also listed this as a village where people live. There's no one in it. It's, it looks like nothing. It's, it, again, it, this idea of almost their fantasy land that they've created of Palestine, of Bible times, where the Palestinians don't exist unless they're sort of conveniently illustrating something. And I think that's me done. Yep. Oh, and this is another interesting. This is a painting by Claude Condor, who was one of the surveyors. And again, this is, I think you can see, I think it's probably meant to be one of the Western surveyors with the implement, which bears an uncanny resemblance to the logo of the Palestine Exploration Fund, if you've ever seen it. It's pretty much that. And looking over this, again, empty landscape, surveying it. He's like, I know what I'm doing. We are, essentially, we're compiling everything about your land for you, well, for us. And it's interesting to note that the presumably native people are just sitting there, portrayed as doing nothing, just decoration, really. And yeah, and back to Michael now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chloe. So, as Chloe mentioned, the expertise that comes um, from the Palestine Exploration Fund is very heavily linked to the British military. And they're often able to do these detailed surveys of Palestine um, thanks to archaeological cover. But the British were also deeply interested in mapping Palestine because they might want to take it over one day. And this is particularly the case as their interests next door in Egypt grow. So throughout the 1860s, there are a number of major surveys. We saw some of the Royal Engineers earlier. This is one done by the Royal Navy of the coast of Palestine. Very detailed um, maps that are uh, viewed um, from uh, the perspective of a ship at sea. And what's lovely about this one is not only do you see this bird's eye image of Haifa on the left and Akka on the right, but at the top we also have this 3D sense of the view of the, the coastline from the ship that gives a sense of depth and perspective. And it's this technique that the British will employ when they do start to try to take over Palestine uh, during the First World War. Um, in 1916, the British undertake um, their first attempts to survey Palestine from the air. Um, and one of the most details of these early surveys 
is um, on the port city of Aqaba, now of course um, in today's Jordan. And it was undertaken from a, a very early aircraft car carrier, HMS Raven, um, that surveys the, uh, the port and the, t and the Ottoman defences uh, down there. Um, as you can see, it's a very similar setup to that map from several decades before. We have the bird's eye view of the coastline and then the view um, from the perspective um, of the ship. But there are also other ways during the First World War that the British tried to map and understand Palestine, many of which shared the same aesthetics as the earlier biblical and archaeological fantasies. This, for example, is a painting that was made just after um, the First World War by Sidney Carline. He was one of two brothers who took to the skies to paint Palestine and aerial combat from an aerial perspective. This is an attack by British warplanes uh, on Ottoman ships on the Sea of Galilee. And again, if you look at the landscape here, there is nothing. Tiberius is not there. The many villages and uh, in, uh, industrial infrastructure around the Sea of Galilee has disappeared. All we have is this barren um, landscape. But during the First World War, perhaps one of the most important aspects is that the maps of the survey of Western Palestine found a new life when the Royal Air Force decided to try and fly over and map the front. They used the maps of Western Palestine to situate their aerial photography. So each of the points marked on this map from um, Jalud all the way to the Jordan River are not taken from military maps. These are taken from the archaeological survey of Western Palestine. So this seemingly innocent project of trying to map the ancient sites and antiquities of Palestine in the 1870s becomes used in 1916, 17 and 18 to allow the British to map and further their conquest in the region. And this, of course, marks the beginning of British rule in Palestine. And I think it's important for us as we uh, move forward in time to remember the, the biblical and ancient legacy of the British understandings of this space. And I want to return just to finish up to the trope of these figures sitting in the foreground. In our first maps, we saw local figures who sit there passively and as simply as uh, pieces of art almost. In the painting of the Palestine Exploration Fund, the learned and knowledgeable British person comes in to make sense of the situation. Now, when the British conquered Palestine, this scene got a new lease of life. This is a film from the Imperial War Museum. Here we can see, I don't know if you can make out, there is a young girl dressed in traditional Palestinian clothing underneath the tree, and now she is joined by a British soldier. This replication of this trope um, uh, marks a new era where the British fulfil their ancient and biblical destiny with repercussions, of course, uh, right until today. Thank you very much um, for listening to us.